of a, of a two-dimensional stencil code. That, um, so yesterday, Gilles, Gilles gave an example for the, for the DGEM, which was a compute-bound application. And this example is at the other end of the spectrum. It's a memory bandwidth-bound application. So we'll go through a few different steps. The first step, we're going to introduce some vectorization to this, to this simple code. And then we're going to introduce some OpenMP threading. And then we'll look at a slightly more advanced application that requires blocking and techniques to improve cache reuse. So just a little bit of mathematical motivation. This isn't really a, a very, very thorough treatment. But so the, we're going to be looking at the solution of a, a two-dimensional uh, diffusion equation which uh, on a rectangular domain. And we uh, discretize it using our finite differences. So we end up with using finite differences for the spatial and four differences for the temporal in terms. Oh. OK. Now, the, um, the actual, OK. <laughs> So, so the, the actual um, application is, isn't that important. We're more, more interested in the, in the optimization. But we use an implicit time-stepping scheme. And what it does is we have a two-dimensional domain that's discretized using a two-dimensional regular grid. And at each time step, we take the values at the current time step t, and we apply this stencil to the, uh, to the input field, and we then get the solution at the next time step. Now, so, and we do this for every single point in the domain. So if we have a grid that has 100 points in the I dimension and 100 points in the J dimension, we'll end up doing, uh, doing this for 10,000 points, for every single point in the domain. And for each point, we can go through and we can count up the number of our floating point operations. If we assume that this value here is constant everywhere in the domain, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Seven floating point operations, additions and multiplications. And we, load, we have one, two, three, four. This value here at ij appears twice. And then we have the value that we write out. So we have a total of six, six loads and stores. So for each bit of, uh, each bit of memory that we load, we're not doing very many, uh, very, very many uh, operations. So it's very low arithmetic intensity. We saw with the uh, matrix multiplication example yesterday that once you had loaded a bit of information into memory, you could reuse it many, many times. So the, we'll get straight into the tutorial. The tutorial code is in the, uh, the same directory, in tutorials Laplace. And I developed this code and tested it on uh, Sandy Bridge. So all of the scripts I've got in there are designed to run on Pilatus. So you can uh, copy this to scratch on Pilatus and start working there. And there's a make file provided with targets for each exercise. And I've d in the make file, we use uh, the Intel compiler. And if you want, you might want to, at some points, add things like uh, vectorization reports to check your work. So just go into the make file and edit this, this line here if you want to add additional flags. And you can also test it with the uh, GNU compiler or copy it to the, uh, or also test it on Toady if you want to, using the GNU compiler. So just, just before we start, we have a two-dimensional grid of points in this example. And, but the two-dimensional grid of points is allocated as one single long, as one single uh, block of memory. And it's indexed using I major storage. So if we think about a, a point here in the, in the stencil, the value to its left at i minus 1j is stored in the, uh, in the is, so, oh, sorry, points that are in the i dimension are contiguous. So these three points here are contiguous in memory. And these two points here, above and below, will be the i dimension of the domain, domain away. So this will have important implications for the loop orders that we use later on. So we initialize, so we start with that. For this diffusion equation we're, we're solving, we have 
this shouldn't be zeros, this should be ones. We have value of one all around the edge of the domain and zero in the middle, and over time, the, the, eventually the domain will become one everywhere, because the diffusion equation. And this is an example of how to call. So once you've compiled the code, you can then run it to you, give the name of the executable and the dimension of the, this is the x and the y dimension of the domain, and this is the number of time steps. But you can look, there are some script files that have examples for how to do this. So the first exercise, we start with uh, a single thread, just a serialized version of the code. It's in Laplace.c, and we're going to try and vectorize it. So the first thing to do is to uh, copy it in and open up the source code and have a look. There are three different versions of the, uh, of the stencil in there. So just have a look at those and think about which ones you expect to run faster and why. And then uh, make, make it and run it, and then there's some more steps after that. To, uh, so yeah, once, once you've looked at that, you can start to look at make, how to vectorize, vectorize these loops. Okay. okay, so these are some results from when I, from when I ran this earlier. Now, I, my results, I think, look a little bit different from people's. But so the, the times I've got here are for doing 200 uh, time steps, just like in the, uh, in the scripts that you had. Now, the, the first interesting observation was that um, for, for, these, two, for the, these two versions of the loop, so this is after I had done the vectorization, up to 66 by 66 or 130 by 132 mesh, the different loop orders, the IJ loop order or the JA loop order, there wasn't much of a, of a difference. But then after that, for larger mesh sizes, we can see that the, uh, this is now about two times difference, it's about eight times difference, two times difference again. We've got something funny happening with cash here. And then up to about five times difference for, uh, for this large mesh. Now the reason why, did anybody figure out why the reason why the JI loop order should be faster than the IJ loop? Yeah, because the data is laid out in an I major storage order. So to be able to get efficient use of cache, you have to load, you have to have the I loop on the inner loop. So your inner loop is striding along the data in the, in the order that it's um, stored in memory. And then this is when I got, when I added vectorization, I got a speed up of about, about two times. So for all of these meshes up to about 1,000 by 1,000. And then for the larger mesh, you see I had some speed up, but it wasn't, it wasn't as significant. This is about a 33% speed up. And the reason that we see a smaller speed up for this larger problem is, is in this last row of the table here. So you say this is the size of one of the input and output fields in kilobytes. And you can see here we've got two input and output fields. So this 16, this, that would make for about 16 and a half megabytes of uh, data. So that you would be able to fit both the input and the output fields in the 20 megabytes of L3 cache on a Sandy Bridge processor. So that means between time steps, all the information is stored in cache. So the, the CPU, so we are mostly compute bound. So the vectorization has a significant effect there. But for this problem, each field is 32, about 32 megabytes in size. So there's no way that all of that information is going to be stored in the cache between iterations. So we become bandwidth bound because the processor spends most of its time waiting for information to come from, uh, from memory. So the vectorization has a much smaller effect. Now, now the, set, the second exercise we're going to look at is in uh, Laplace underscore OMP dot C. And it's where it takes the, uh, the vectorized version of the, or the, the two JI versions of the loop, the one that's vectorized and the one that's not vectorized. And your job is to insert OpenMP directives into those two uh, in, into those two uh, functions, and then compile it, make OpenMP, and there's an OpenMP.sh shell script. 
So you want, might want to use the vectorization report to verify that everything was vectorized, although it seems that some people are getting different results from the ones I got when I uh, double and triple checked everything this morning. They're finding that uh, everything vectorizes. But <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, what, what do you observe? And again, it's, it's very important to, uh, I mean, a very big hint about what's going on with the underlying cache and processor architecture is in looking at what sort of scaling you get for small meshes and for large meshes and what reasons there might be for any differences that you observe. Okay, so I, I see lo lots of emails getting checked, so most people have probably finished. So this, this, these are the results I got. I saw a lot of people had the same results. Sometimes they had to run it a couple of times to get to get these <laughs> to get to get the same results. It's um, yeah, that's one of the problems of doing tutorials like this. So I have got the results here for a small the small mesh, and I've written down again the size. This is the total amount of memory required to store one of the fields, and this is the large mesh. So for the small mesh, we can see that for um, one thread, vectorization is, gives us a really good speed up, about three times. And again, for two threads, and things get twice as fast. For four threads, we have again three times speed up. And it's not quite three times for, for, 16, or for 16 threads, but we see we get consistent speed up as we increase the number of threads and vectorization gives significant speed up all the way. And the reason for that is because the fields are small enough to fit into cache. So the first, during the first time step, everything gets loaded from memory and stored in cache. And then subsequent time steps just loop over that don't have to fetch information from DRAM. So as we add more threads, it speeds up nicely and the vectorization works very effectively. For this larger problem, it's memory bandwidth bound. So for one or two threads, we see we get very good speed up. Again, you know, here from one to two threads, we get about a two times speed up for both codes. But then we see something interesting. If we look at the uh, vectorized version, we see about twice as fast. And then this here is giving us about, I don't know, that's about 15% speed up going from two threads to four. And then after that, we get just ignore, ignore the results for 16 threads for the time being. But we get absolute, we get no speed up going from four threads to eight threads. And this is because each socket has a limited amount of memory bandwidth. So there's a maximum amount, amount of bandwidth it can, or a maximum amount of information it can fetch and write to DRAM uh, per second. And you will we find that between two or three threads, if you have a really efficient vectorized code from memory bandwidth co bound code, you will reach that upper bandwidth. So adding more threads doesn't speed the application up because it can't fetch information any faster from memory. So that's what we see here. And that's why both the vectorized and unvectorized codes are about, uh, give us the same times for four and eight threads. Because at that point, Vectorization is no longer helping because we're spending more time waiting for information to come in from DRAM. Now, the problem, the problem is that when we use 16 threads, we're using eight threads on the first socket and eight threads on the second socket. So we should actually have twice the amount of global memory bandwidth, but we don't. We see that we're actually, we are a, a tiny bit faster, about 6% faster. And this is because of what we call our NUMA, our NUMA effects where, and that's got to do with exactly which bit of, bit of memory the information data is stored in, and I'll be talking about that tomorrow. I just wanted to put this in here as a little bit of a, to get you to start thinking about it for tomorrow's tutorial. Now, for the, for the final example, I wanted to do something where we could use blocking to improve cache reuse. The problem with the Laplace example is that it's not really possible to do that because it simply reads from memory and writes back out. There's no intermediate storage stages. So I came up with uh, this example, which I've actually gotten from, uh, from a climate code that I'm working on, where we apply a uh, dispersion operator. So it's a fourth order operator, and which can be written as applying the Laplacian to a field and then, then applying it again.
And that's exactly what we do. We have this intermediate buffer where we, we apply the Laplace into our input field and store it in a buffer. And then to compute the output result, we then apply the Laplace into the buffer. And the way we treat this, we can use blocking in the looping on this buffer to improve the uh, cache reuse. So that's what the final example. So the final example is a little bit more complicated, but it gives some, uh, some very interesting results. So the, uh, the example is in uh, dispersion.c. And there are three versions of the loop again. The first doesn't use any blocking, and the second two versions <coughs> use, use blocking of our varying levels of sophistication. So the first thing is just to have a little look at them, stick your hand up and ask any questions, because if you, if you have any, if you can't understand what's going on, and then maybe, maybe have a guess at which, or which version you think is going to be faster. So to compile and run the code, make dispersion, and then there's a script here that will run it. So uh, one thing I probably should have mentioned is that for the, for the last example, the OpenMP example, you, to get the best OpenMP performance, or to actually get the thing to scale, you want to have the OpenMP statement, the Pragma OMP Parallel 4, around the outside loop, not, not the inside one. Otherwise, you'll, um, you will see the exact opposite to speed up. And this is the general rule when you're using OpenMP to try and make your OpenMP loops as close to the outside as possible so that each individual loop has the, the biggest chunks or pieces of work to do. So um, would people like me to get the code up on the screen and maybe explain a little bit about what's going on in each implementation or are you happy figuring it out for yourselves? I see a few people nodding their heads, so I'll do it. Um, you can ignore me if you've uh, already figured it out or you, uh, you don't like listening to me. Let's have a look. Where am I? Okay, so I've, uh, I've got the, uh, the memory here. I've got the, the code up here. So this is version one of the... Th th this is version one. So we can see we've got two main loops. So this one loops, J loops over the whole... J and I, we loop over the entire domain. And what do we do? We load in... Uh, we see we're passed in three pointers here. A pointer to the input field and the output field, and this is what we had in the previous versions. But now we also have a pointer to a buffer where we're going to store that initial Laplace, when we calculate the Laplace of the input field, we're going to store that in there, and then once we've computed that, we're then going to use it again to compute the output field. So this is the, uh, the version one, the most basic version. We loop over the entire domain. We get the input field, so this is just getting pointers to rows in the input field. 
and we get a and then we write the result out into the buffer. So B is a pointer into the buffer, and we calculate the Laplacian. And then once, and then this will fill the entire buffer field. So if the buffer is a thousand by a thousand field, this, this will loop over the entire field and fill it up. And then we have a second loop where we loop over the entire domain again. This time we get a four, we get four point, oh, sorry, three pointers into the uh, buffer, and we now calculate the, the Laplacian using this information from the buffer and then add it to our input result, input field and store it to the, um, the output. Now, this, for small domains where everything is held in cache, this should be a reasonably efficient implementation. But we could run into problems if the domain is very big, because here we're loading in to, we're basically loading in the input field and, the, uh, and also the buffer where we're going to write into. And if we load, if these fields are bigger than cache, by the time we reach the end of the loop, the data that we loaded at the start will, be, will have been evicted from cache. And then when we go to do this loop, we're going to start again at the start of the buffer, and we're going to have to fetch that memory from RAM again. So that's going to be a slow problem. So just in doing one time step, We've loaded everything from RAM, then we've stored it back to RAM, then we're going to load it up again. We've got to load it again, and we're going to get probably quite poor performance. But again, I should say that if, every, if the fields are small enough that everything fits in cache, that shouldn't be such a big problem. So that inspires us to have a look at a, a second implementation, this one here, which differs a little bit. We've still got two loops here a loop that calculates the buffered values again, and then a loop that takes the buffered values and stores them to the output. But you see they're inside a loop here that loops over blocks. So I've divided the, the domain up into blocks that are uh, blocks in the horizontal. So we've only got, um, I haven't broken it up into little square blocks. We just do uh, blocking in the J dimension. So I have the, no, this is the block dimension, so maybe the blocks are eight high or 16 high. I calculate how many blocks are in the domain, and we subtract four here because we've got a boundary that's too wide on each side, so we've got to take off the values for those, ba those boundary points. And then inside each block, I, I calculate the, the column, the, the starting column and the ending column, and then I just process the buffer values for that block, and then store and then process the uh, the output for that block. So hopefully, as long as the block is small enough, all the information I just computed will be kept in will still be in cache, and it'll be available when I when I do this step. Now the third, I did a third. Uh, I was also I also did a third implementation because buffer here is. A, mem a region of memory that is the same size as the input and output fields. And the idea, the idea for the third version was, well, what if I, for each thread in my application, I just created a small thread private buffer that was just the size of one block. And, that, and then the thread would, each time it processed a block, it would store the result in its own private, uh, private little buffer. And, hope, and that means but when it goes, when it processes multiple blocks, that buffer will remain in cache and we'll get a better performance, theoretically. So that's what we do in the third version. So again, it's starting, it's starting to get a little bit more complicated. And you can imagine how much more complicated things can get when you've got a bigger or a more realistic problems. So here I start up an OMP parallel region. So you notice there's no OMP parallel 4. The, the, the for loop is inside here. If you do this, what this will do is this will actually start the parallel region. So everything inside these curly braces here will be executed in parallel. So the threads will be started up. So what do I, what do, I do? I first of all figure out which thread, the, wait, OMP get thread num. You can call that when you're inside a parallel region and that will tell you what thread, that will give you the thread ID of, of this thread and then I've got a series of buffers. So if we've got eight threads, I'll have eight buffers. So this, so each thread will now get a pointer to its local buffer, and then we proceed with the other uh, loop as we did in the last one.
but instead of using a global buffer, we're now using this local, this local buffer. And uh, yep. so does that, does that make sense? A little bit? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you can try to, try to run it and see, see if this approach actually helps, or I should say, see for which scenarios it helps and for which scenarios it's not that helpful. Here are some results. I, got, I, put, I put some results for our three, three different meshes. So first of all, for a small mesh, we see the behavior that we've been seeing in, in the other examples, that the three versions are, I, I would say that that's, that's identical. We get ex identical results for the three versions. Because all three, each of the three versions vectorize properly. The only difference is how they try to maximize uh, reuse of cache. But for this small problem, the entire mm -hmm. thing will fit into L3 cache. So we don't really, s the, the blocking techniques don't give us any real benefit. Now for a slightly, for a slightly larger mesh, again for one, one thread, there isn't really any, uh, this, this version actually performs a little bit slower than, uh, than this, that, that, than the, uh, the version one. And again, there's not really much difference. It's only when we start to uh, make the mesh, well, increase the number of threads, that we start, that we see an improvement, like uh, we see this version three becoming faster. And then all of a sudden here, when we go to eight threads, all of a sudden, this method becomes much, much faster. And the reason for that is each core has 256 kilobytes of L2 cache. So as you increase the number of threads, you increase the amount of L2 cache that's available to you. And going from four threads, where you'll have a total of one megabyte of L2 cache, to eight threads, where you have a total of uh, two megabytes of L2 cache, just improves for, for this for this method here improves the uh, the reuse of information and we get we get this very nice uh, very nice scaling I don't think this um, microphone's working that well and then when we go to a much larger problem so this is our uh, four times bigger again so we see again no real benefit for one thread but then as we increase the number of threads we can see that the techniques that reuse information in cache start to uh, become much more competitive. So again, for eight threads on this larger problem, we're over a little bit over twice as twice as fast, which is which is nice. So the, I think the real take-home message from this is: if you go and write your vectorized code and you write your buffering and your blocking, and you are uh, I think you've got a pretty good thing. Don't go and testing it just for one and two threads and then say, oh, the results, that didn't give me any speed up. It wasn't worth the effort. Try to do it all the way out to as many threads as you've got available and really play around and try to understand whether or not, you know, whether or not you're, uh, you're actually, you might be getting some speed up. And that's particularly important because you need to go beyond two threads. You need to go to three or four threads before you start to maximize, start to reach the limits of our memory bandwidth. And you can see for all of the examples we looked at earlier, oh, the real speed up started to happen around four threads. And then we see that again here, because by four threads, this, co this version here is completely memory bandwidth bound. It doesn't improve going from four threads to eight threads. And the same for this version here. But this version here gets a speed up of another 30%, say. So if um, anyone's got any more questions, just uh, put your hand up.